Hey, we're looking at the mission. This is uh, White Dog Games. Ben Madison did it. No, I got my issues uh, with Ben Madison's other designs, but we'll see about this one. Um, uh, this is, uh, it's packaged by Blue Panther. They do a sort of print-on-demand type thing. And they really fucked up the box. Um, you can see this was actually all pooched up as though they didn't try to seal it. And I don't know if it'll ever, I think it'll stick. Um, and they got a lot of, a lot of wrinkle <laughs> on here. Uh, as if they were slapping it together very quickly. Uh, maybe they had a rush of orders, I don't know. Um, my initial intention had been to play this solo. Uh, it's a solo design game on the spread of Christianity. Uh, and get a feel for it, but you know what? Uh, I'm just not feeling the... Uh, sit back and enjoy a game by myself feeling at all. However, being able to speak and share the experience, well, I think I can do that and enjoy that as much as I, I thought I could. One of the reasons is because uh, some of the mechanisms might be a little tricky, etc. Which means, of course, don't look at this to learn how to play the game. <laughs> I'm going to go through the rules. Uh, that's part of the experience. But there are a lot of other people who've done videos on this. If you're interested in the normal type of playthrough, look at the normal, look at other people's stuff. If you're interested in a normal rules explanation, look at other people's stuff. If you're addicted to my shit, uh, yeah, for whatever reason that might be, <laughs> feel free to keep watching. Um, okay, so why did I pick this up? Uh, because, you know, I mean... I am no Christian by any means. Um, I was brought up mm, very, very mildly Catholic in the sense that, like, you know, sometimes we'd make it out to Christmas Mass <laughs> because my mom liked the music. Uh, <laughs> and that's about it. Um, uh, but I was baptized. I, I, I went, you know, to communion and everything. Um, once, twice, four times, I don't know. Uh, I don't think I've ever confessed. But, anyhow. Um, I do, however, have a tremendous interest in how religion spread and uh, how they compete with one another for the minds and souls of their uh, potential followers. And this feels like, wow, I absolutely needed to get this game. And when I first noticed it, which was probably pretty soon after it came out, I had that feeling and I'm like, okay, I subscribe to it. I'm going to watch for a used copy, whatever. Um, I never saw a used copy come up for a price that I thought was worthwhile. And after uh, my wife died, I was just kind of like, you know what? Screw it. I've been wanting this one. It had been getting a lot of buzz uh, over the year. Uh, you know, hey, it's a solo designed game in a year when a lot of people are stuck solo. It relates uh, to to people's faith at a time when faith may be being challenged. It got a lot of noise. <laughs> and, um, so anyway, I, I was kind of like just, you know, watching it happen and I'm like, screw it. It's not that expensive. Let me just order a copy. Um, now, what about Ben Madison to begin with my experiences beforehand? Because I disliked uh, a combat design that he puts in play. He makes very, very chromey, well, the game that, I, that most comes to mind for me is Liberia. But I think I've played another one of his games as well that has this sort of um, select how many dice you want to roll for combat. And if you roll too high, you do no damage. But otherwise, you know, you do damage. And it's ba your quality is kind of how high that damage can go. And it's a clever system. 
Um, I just don't think it works in military uh, terms. Uh, it ends up with, oh, I committed really hard and did no damage to anyone else, you know, <laughs> which is sort of the opposite. Yeah, the effect should be, yeah, if you commit really hard, you might still whiff, uh, but it's less likely, and you're more likely to take damage. So I, I feel like there's something clever in the, in, in the choice, but it's a choice that I'm not sure that I would disagree with um, when it comes to something like this. Well, that system's not in here, so... <laughs> uh, <laughs> there was no, no challenge there in terms of that. Um, I don't know if this is a States of Siege-like game. I played one at least States of Siege. Uh, it was a much more complex game with cards and all kind of tracks that I had to keep track of. I don't feel like this uh, is quite on that line, but it's not that far. Uh, and, and again, it's solo designed. Um, for his rules, what I found was uh, there is um, a disturbing to me anti-Muslim bias in it. Not in the, the actual, you know, mechanisms necessarily, but in the tenor of some of the comments. Um, and by which I mean, look, you know, Christianity, he complains about how, you know, the Muslims slaughtered the Christians and the Jews, and mainly the Christians, and, you know, conquered all this territory and everything. Uh, and to some extent, yes, uh, but it's kind of neglecting the story of Christianity had its own very harsh conversion tactics as well. This was just the way of the time. Rome had its own harshnesses. Look, let's not lay it all on the Muslims, you know. <laughs> um, it may be an overreaction or a, count, uh, a counter push to um, feelings that he has that the Muslims are being misrepresented as being this religion of peace or whatever. I don't know that anybody has terribly historically represented them that way, especially in the initial conquests. So, yeah, I, I just don't know, you know. I mean, yes, there's sort of the, oh, the Muslims were just happy in their own territory in the Near East, and, you know, <laughs> the Christians came and crusaded all over their ass and killed a lot of them, and that's true. Uh, and it's also true that, um, you know, the conquest of Spain was relatively benign for a conquest and a conversion. Um, both sides, really. <laughs> in, in part because the Muslim initial conquest and conversion was essentially a facade, uh, that didn't really seek, you know, any kind of genocidal uh, policies that were performed, for the most part, by other sides. Um, anyway, I say relatively, it was still bloody. Uh, anyway, let's get away from that. I might end up griping and grousing about it more as we walk through. So what do we have? Well, again, I haven't really played the game, so it's hard for me to link to everything. Um, we have a map which is a set of tracks running, so the A track runs whoops, um, up into Ireland. Uh, there's a B track that runs here, and it's basically paths under which both religions and military prowess push along in each of these cases, and there's six of them. Uh, each of them is represented by their own die roll. And there's some interrelations that would exist between these tracks. Uh, it's an abstraction and a simplification, you know, to say, look, this path that goes through Gaul and up into England and whatever is just kind of ignoring the Germanic aspect, especially since the Holy Rolling Empire comes into this. Um, 
let's see what else you have. Uh, of interest are these areas, which are your hordes, which are gonna move down the track. And they're gonna be sort of a, a at least initially, a barbarian and conquesting faction. Um, and they might not be pagan. Uh, some of them are you know, like Aryans or something like that, that are, eh, claim to be Christian, you know? <laughs> We're not considered such by the church. Um, but then, uh, you know, some of your goal is going to be uh, to convert those hordes uh, as, as well as, you know, to resist them until you can convert them, basically. Um, let's see what else you have. The, you have this, which is basically a setup track, from what I can tell. Um, None of the hordes are set up to begin with. I think that's uh, maybe a mistake. Um, I, you get to place everything on the board, but then w once you follow the setup rules, most of it ends up in these cups or on, on the actual game board. So I'm not sure how much um, it's called a counter tray, how much it really, it would be helpful to have an actual counter tray that had these segments in it that you could throw your pieces in. Um, I don't know how much as a sorting mechanism it's terribly helpful. It's useful the first time, I don't think I'd use it again. Uh, this is your turn record chart essentially, with various heresies showing up on it. It also has some additional information. It's color coded by the period of the game that you're in, which is a importance. Um, I had to swap dice out for this game. I don't know why, but I absolutely could not use my normal Avalon Hill dice. I had to use my rounded dice. I, I don't know what is behind that determination. Um, I've got four cups. I think it said you needed five, but I haven't seen uh, a reason for the fifth cup yet. Um, they're divided into... what are these? These are uh, different faiths. These are population tiles, basically, that show a population, a type to the tile. So, for example, Jews are... And there, um, there's a Christian side and a non-Christian side to them. And yes, there's Christian, Christianized Jews. Um, just like there are Christianized women. <laughs> uh, the Jews are surrounding Jerusalem on five of the six tracks. The sixth one is a random tile. Uh, these are called wafers. Uh, <laughs> they serve as randomizers of various kinds. We'll see how they work. And these are heresies. I've got ebonites in here, but there's a whole bunch of them uh, charted out here. These are called faith tiles. Um, you have different Bibles, which you can put on each track, and they'll allow you certain advantages during play once you get them um, translated. Uh, you have to create a Greek Bible before you can translate any others. Uh, you have kings, who on the other side have pagan tyrants. Uh, bishops, who have an archbishop on the other side. And popes, who can go schismatic on you. Again, you send them down specific tracks. These bishops have spilled over. The great theologians, I think, are based off of here. I think they come out of a particular time, but I'm not absolutely certain about that. We'll hit that as we... Whoa, why are my bugamills not on the board? Hmm. Interesting. Okay. <clears throat> um, you have some buildings that you can build. Basically, you're allowed one per track, I believe. Uh, and they have uh, special effects on that track. Knights are going to uh, provide resistance, um, as does the Roman army. The opposite there. Uh, and a as might some other people. You have the rise of... Uh, uh, of Islam that's going to show up in the game. Um, all right, let's start digging into the rules. And <laughs> the rules are very procedural, so I may skim over them uh, in large parts. Okay, so as we're looking at the map, there's one thing we need to talk about 
right away here, this little dashed line. Uh, if Spain becomes Muslim, you cut Spain out of path A while it's Muslim um, so that you can operate on it. Well, this reminds me a little of invasions, just uh, thought-wise. Um, communion. Um, so, the game is making you the Catholic Church in Rome in general. Uh, and the question is whether the other paths remain in communion with Rome or schismatic. Um, in various ways. Let me push this out so I have a little bit more room for now. Uh, a land is Christian if it has a green field tile on it. So this one's still pagan, but it could be converted to Christian. And that's one of your goals is to make things Christian. Um, all Christian path lands on a given path are in communion with you unless there's a schism on that path. Ooh, the Christians on that path then have gone a different way and you have more trouble. Um, Okay, the play the player can't get into the horde homelands. Those are sort of safe spots uh, from which the horde comes out. Sometimes there's a random setup, and that, that may happen during the play of the game, but it's basically you roll a die for path and roll a die uh, for how far along that path it is. And I've already done a couple of random setups. For example, the cult of Isis is up here in Britain, which feels a little weird to me. There's another cult of Isis down here, which feels a little bit better. But it, it does feel a little strange, although there was a, a powerful uh, uh, Mithras... Uh, cult in Ireland of all places which wasn't even Romanized so that's kind of weird um, no tile can ever randomly set up in Ireland since it's impossible to roll a seven well that's useful uh, even if Spain is bypassed under the rule you still do count it for random setup wafers yeah, they're basically randomizers um, of various types. The axe track is the game turn track. We talked about that. Only four. Mm. And they specify Dunnigan's Ceramesis randomizers. <laughs> I chose not to go with the standard. I went with some wider mouth uh, chili cups and, of course, my normal Buddhist uh, uh, offering cups. Uh, you've got a track down here that covers your money, which you're going to use to do actions. And then Dark Ages, uh, you'll accumulate Dark Ages points as you go from certain things. And if that ever passes seven, you lose the game or actually reaches seven. <coughs> uh, okay. Jerusalem doesn't belong to any path. It's controlled by the Romans until it becomes Arab-controlled on turn 21. Uh, no unit can move into Jerusalem, either by advancing or retreating. Hordes that reach Jerusalem just stop moving. Other units forced to enter it are eliminated. Uh, exception, Arabs may retreat into Arab-occupied Jerusalem. I'm not sure. I don't think the apostles come back ever. Uh, the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire's uh, extent is marked by these, well, <laughs> pagan Rome. Uh, let me make sure I've got them all, the others on the right side. I'm just going to drop them quickly. Yeah. So those should all be pagan. When Rome converts to Christianity, it all converts. So <clears throat> I don't know if you really need to flip those. But anyway, um, we'll talk about the military resistance capability, which is this number here on these type of counters. It also exists um, 
This V is another symbol of that. Uh, notably, this is not that sort of a population, your Christian, or the population of people that you could convert <laughs> at this point. Um, okay, starting on turn 21, the Islamic Caliphate seizes Jerusalem and grows by attacking from behind. So normally you're going to be facing, or early on, you're going to be facing these hordes that are barbarians that can cause you problems. Um, and to some extent, the Roman, uh, the Roman extent of influence and the Roman army, which is placed anywhere within Rome, um, are going to provide you with some protection. However, <laughs> uh, once uh, Muslims come in, you get something that starts in Jerusalem, actually, and spreads out from there, coming up behind you, and can cause you problems. Um, a jihad shows that the Arabs control the land the tile is in and all the lands between it and the Jerusalem box, basically, again. So this is indicating Roman control from Jerusalem down to Thebes, okay? If a horde was here, wherever it is along this track is how far from the horde's homeland it controls. When the Arabs come in, they will be coming in from Jerusalem as its center, the same way Rome is centered on Jerusalem. Don't worry about that. Uh, <laughs> uh, the hordes. The hordes indicate the horde controls the tile the land is in. I did not see anything that said the hordes get set up at the beginning of the game. And I may have just missed something. But I still don't see it. There's two scenarios, one, um, one from the beginning of the game, which is, to me, the most interesting. And then, as always, right, you know, I went the entire campaign. And the other from the beginning of Islam, in case you don't have as much time. Uh, kings and tyrants all control the space that they are in and nothing else. Uh, the Persian Empire is here at the beginning. Um, they're marked with tiles that again have a military capability that defends itself um, from Arabs and hordes. Nubia. Once Nubia is set up, um, the Nubian tile is similar to a Roman control tile. They control the land they're in plus all other lands in the direction of Jerusalem until Roman control or Arab control. Um, they can attack forward against the Shua or Himyar clans. Well, the Himyar clans are here. The Shua are not on the board yet. Uh, like Romans, they have an intrinsic defense against Arabs, and they attack backwards against Arabs. And it'll always be considered Christian. Uh, uncontrolled lands are where Romans, Persians, hordes, Arabs, or rulers have not, uh, have, have no control. So basically anything, so for example, at the beginning of the game, pagan Rome, everything between pagan Rome and the Himyar clans is empty. It's uncontrolled. Now a ruler could show up and control it, but, uh, popes, there's a big city on each path. What's a big city? I think it's this thing. Yeah, I see lots of things. No, it's this. So Carthage is the big city on this path. Rome's the big city. Constantinople, etc. Yeah. Okay. Um, that'll eventually end up with a pope on it, who's the leader of the Christian um, of that path. Uh, each pope has its own type of hat, but they're all shown with the Roman hat. <laughs> just to make it easier. <laughs> okay. Um, game setup is ruled by this, and there's some randomness to it, and I've already done that. Okay, each turn is consists of a sequence of phases that must be done in order, and they really must. Um, and we have a sequence of play over here that tells us what we do. But we need some general rules 
to take care of first. So army combat. An army is a tile with a white hexagon on it. The army tiles are either friendly or hostile. Uh, sometimes that depends on circumstances. Uh, okay. An advanced force, an advanced force says AF on it. No, it's a white hexagon with a number in it. So for example, the pagan Rome looks like it's one. Okay. Uh, this number will be its combat strength. It can move one space at a time to invade a hostile land and it defends itself when attacked. This is the Roman army, the Roman control tiles, Nubia, Arabs, hordes, and the Holy Rolling Empire. Uh, the Abbasid Caliphate tiles are found on the back of jihads. These are AF units. They have a number on them, but they don't usually attack. Self-defense is one with an empty hexagon on it. The Roman capital. Uh, these can't move or attack, but they do defend themselves. If a hostile army retreats backward onto a land with an occupied SD unit, the SD unit sits there and does nothing. It only defends itself against a hostile army that's attacking forward into the land. That hostile army that ha has already passed it by um, is considered to have conquered it already. Um, martyr field tiles either defend themselves or submit to occupation without a fight at the player's discretion. Here's one. See, it has a military symbol on it. Oh, look. Pagan martyrs. <laughs> awesome. <coughs> Well, you have to convert them, but I didn't know they'd have a combat value. Um, then there's a final type, which is VF for vulnerable force. It has a V on it. Um, they will defend if attacked, but they're eliminated when they're defeated, which is important. These things don't get eliminated. They get passed by and can rebirth, essentially, as a force. Well, they're always there as a force, um, but they can be reapplied to forces which conquered them if they get pushed, if those forces get pushed back uh, away from them. Okay, combat occurs when one army invades a land containing an army hostile to it. Each defending army in the land gets one shot to repel the invading army. The defending army rolls a die. If it's higher than the combat strength of the invading army, the invasion is repelled, and the invading army is bumped back to the land it came from. If that army has any remaining attacks, uh, it can spend its next attack to re-enter the defending land, and the defender rolls again to repel it. Um, if the failed attack was by a player's own army, the player gets to choose to launch another attack, but he has to pay uh, Solidus for it. A defeated advanced force unit will retreat. A defeated self-defense force remains in its location under enemy occupation, and it has no military value. A it's interesting. Okay, so if you're ever occupied, you have no value until the enemy's thrown off of you. I don't think somebody can come from behind in that case. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, a defeated vulnerable force is removed from the game. Persian units are gone for good if defeated. Kings and tyrants can reappear by random event. If a defending AF unit is forced to retreat by being defeated, the defender retreats one land. They retreat it's going to be obvious which direction they go in. <laughs> it's hard to explain, and the rules go through a lot of work doing so, but basically, you have a place where you're centered from, you have a place you're being attacked from, you retreat away from your attacker. <clears throat> you may be retreating away from where you're centered from, though. Like, Rome is centered in Jerusalem. When the uh, jihad comes up, it may drive you back. Retreating Romans, here's special rules that explains how Romans retreat and who forces them towards Jerusalem, who forces them out towards the hordes. Uh, Roman control tiles and the Roman army are allowed to attack during a Roman offensive. Each costs a buck for each tile moved. The tile moves one space forward and then has to launch an attack. If the Roman army and a Roman control tile 
are stacked together in attack, they both get a shot at invading. Each attacking Roman tile has to spend a buck for its attack. Um, the first may spend an attack before the second decides to spend an attack. If either shot is successful, both are allowed to advance. Now, this is worded a little weird because attack is really moving into a space um, and then the defender gets a role to resist you. So I think we're going to have to kind of interpret that a little bit but we can see what they try to mean there. Intrinsic defense versus Arabs. Romans, Nubians, Nubians and HRE-controlled lands have an intrinsic strength versus Arabs. When an Arab enters such a land, the land fights against the Arab with a die roll as if it contained an SD unit. <coughs> <coughs> Roman attacks against Arabs. The Roman lands can also be used uh, to conduct a Roman offensive against an Arab in an adjacent land on the road to Jerusalem. You pay the usual cost, roll a die to try to push the Arab back toward Jerusalem. Aha! Okay, so Roman attacks are different. Pay the usual $1 cost, then roll one die to try to push the Arab back towards Jerusalem. A roll higher than the Arab strength succeeds, and the now empty land vacated by the Arabs retreat is now Roman controlled for all purposes. No, Roman attacks against Arabs are different. Okay. If a land adjacent to an Arab contains the Roman army, the Roman army can attack the Arab at the normal $1 and advance into a liberated land if successful. Uh, you're free to do it the other way and attack the Arab with the land's intrinsic strength, but this leaves the Roman army in the land. Okay, so I guess the joint attacks apply here too somehow. I, again, there's things are kind of muddled, but I think we can get the idea. Uh, the Holy Rolling Empire and Nubia tiles are like Roman control tiles, but the Roman army can't enter Nubia. No shot. Okay. So, the history phase is the first part of the, the turn, and it's a series of different things. First of all, the act table shows you which era of the game you're in. When you start a new era, special rules take place. So, uh, the apostolic age, which is two turns, uh, has no special rules. The Pax Romana, all the red apostles will be turned into relics because they're dead. Um, on each relic, a bishop will be placed who will continue the mission work. Um, then you deploy the popes, each in the big city of the pope's printed path. If the land has no field tile in it, you pick a heresy tile from the heresy cup and put it on top of the new pope. So, you had better get to your big cities. Most of them are pretty close. Carthage looks kind of far away. Constantinople looks kind of far away. Uh, okay, some of them are pretty close. Um, Once the age of Constantine appears, on turn 10, the Christian fortunes change, Constantine joins the church, you flip the Roman capital to Christian and all the pagan Rome tiles to Christian Rome, I don't know why, uh, discard the Pax Lex tile to its Christian, no, in the Roman policy box, and it gets replaced with the Christian emperor tile. An heretical emperor. Okay. Um... The third phase is the Council of Nicaea. Next, the player marks a uh, path... Oh, I'm sorry, this is the third part of the Age of Constantine. The Council of Nicaea. Next, the player marks path A with Catholic, path B with Orthodox uh, from the counter tray. Then's the Council of Arles. Do an economical council, shown on the Acts track. I don't know what happens there. <laughs> it doesn't explain it there. Yeah, that's disturbing. I see the relics become worth more, but maybe there's a rule for economical councils, but I don't remember one. Hmm. Um, and then relics are worth more. Okay, there's a special rule 5.5 for economical council. Okay, there are multiple of these over, 
across the board. So we'll look at how they work. Uh, the fall of Rome, on turn 15, the Western Roman Empire falls to a barbarian attack. You remove the Roman control tile from path A. It's no longer part of the Roman Empire. The Papal States is placed in Rome. If you control it and it defends, uh, no, you control it and it defends itself from hordes and Arabs, you can send the Roman army into the Papal States if you control it, but only to defend it. You can't launch Roman attacks uh, from the Papal States until you have Justinian. Uh, you may move the Roman capital to any Roman-controlled city for free. Add all 16 unused gold coin wafers. They're sitting up there. Uh, to the wafer cup and randomize it. And activate barbarian hordes who deploy in their homeland as follows. Saxons, Bulgars, whatever. Uh, so I think this is when they start. You create Nubia and count how many green Christian tiles without heresy there are, multiply it by two, roll a die, and that depend, determines whether or not Nubia is created. So you want to get down to Nobadia, Makuria, and Alodia, which are here. And have them converted, and you will get three knights uh, in the damaged army box on the map. All right, I gotta swap batteries. Okay. Uh, so what were we at? Mm, the rise of Islam, Arab occupied Jerusalem tile is placed. Uh, six Jihad tiles are placed on Jerusalem and they're going to expand uh, down the tracks and Cult of Isis is removed. I don't know what it does. <laughs> but there you go. We'll see. Uh, early Middle Ages, the Umayyads are replaced by the Abbasids. Uh, the Arab ruling uh, is this. So I'm trying to remember, one of the things, I, I love uh, my, well, wow, religion, the, the great religious texts are all hiding, you know, are, are, are all covering up important stuff uh, type of things. So, you know, I, I was into the Holy Blood, Holy Grail stuff. Didn't really believe it, uh, but wanted to. And... Uh, now I've come more, more to the lines of Jesus wasn't even a real man uh, line, which I feel is more solidly, you know, it's not based on a hoax. It, it, it's based on uh, looking at the New Testament and pretty much figuring that every single story that's out of there is derived from something earlier. And so, you know, clearly that's not a problem if you are Christian, to tell you the truth. Because you can say, you know, there's these echoes, there's there's prophecy, there's all this stuff going on, and of course it would be the same. But if you're trying to take, um, I'm trying to remember his name, Bart Ehrman, I think is his name, uh, atheist view of Christianity's spread, um, it's definitely problematic, right? <laughs> it, 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 it really is sort of the dividing thing is, look, you know, if all of this is prior myths repurposed, what is there that's actually of Jesus, a mortal man? You know, how does that possibly make sense? Especially since when you look at every other, you know, every religion of its period, they're all grabbing these things. And some of them are very clearly um, not real people. You know, uh, some of them are clearly not humans that were not represented by humans who were living on the, on the land, but they take those same stories in the same way that Christianity did. And if that's the case, then, you know, as Richard Carrier puts it, you can discard the whole of the New Testament, basically. <laughs> I mean, not, not the whole, but all of the Jesus references in it. And once you do that, you know, I mean, you're left with visions um, Paul's vision, you know, yeah, <laughs> that's not really compelling in and of itself. Um, a lot of people have always said, wow, Christianity has this, you know, 
if only Muslim had, if only Islam had the amount of link to history that Christianity does. Well, the truth is that some of Islam does, but there's this gap period. And anyway, one of the, the reason I got into this is I think this is about the period where there's someone who's arguing that uh, Mecca is not Mecca. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of evidence in favor that Mecca's changed position and that it may well have been uh, the Nabataean uh, capital, uh, Petra. <clears throat> Which, again, I always find these things just fascinating because to me, the impressive thing is the propagandizing of the religion. Um, that's the thing I'm interested in. And this game is kind of about that. Okay. Uh, so where are we? Okay. The jihads flip over. They no longer move like Arabs. <laughs> but they move if a wafer causes it to. Um, they can be attacked by hordes. Romans, the HRE, and Nubia. Christians under Abbasid rule can become apostatic. Uh, but you can do things to prevent it. If Sufatula, on path F, it's a location, is Roman controlled at this time, the Vandals are removed, all lands west of past path F, Roman control tile, are now uncontrolled, except for any ruler there. On path F, Romans may now expand into uncontrolled lands. <coughs> path F, Nufatula. Uh, I'm not seeing... Sufatula. Did they misspell it or did I misremember it? Sufatula. That's me. Um, relics go up in value. You know, your, your apostles start becoming worth more and more if they remain. Um, at the end of turn 27... Now, I don't know what the start of the early Middle Ages is. Here. Oh, this is the end of the game. Yeah. Um, during the end of turn 27, Christendom decides to fight back after 400 years of invasion and slavery aimed at it by the Muslim world. And then we go into this, uh, the witless and sheep-headed idea that the Crusades were wars of Christ. And this is, you know... <laughs> This is the end of the game. Calculate your victory or defeat. Okay. Now, history continues after you do the figure out what happened in the era. And now we're starting here. And you can see we barely made it in, but there's this whole pre-programming. So the next thing, if any heresies are in the current turn box, they go into the heresy cup. I don't know why it's called hide a heresy. Uh, if there's a theologian in the current turn box, put the great theologian tile in his box on the great theologian's display, which is down here. Um, you'll use them later in the turn. Economical console, if there was one, you deal with this. You randomly select a path. Uh, and if the path... If uh, until you get one without a faith, and then you randomly pick a tile from the faith cup and put in the corresponding faith label on the map to mark the religious posture taken by bishops and Christian leaders on that path. Uh, once a path is marked with a faith, a second die must be rolled to determine the wider church's attitude towards the Christians of that path. You roll a die and compare it to... There's a die roll symbol on the faith cup. I don't know how much you need these, but there's a little die roll on each one of those. Um, if you roll higher than the die roll on the faith, the church votes to excommunicate the Christians on that path. The Pope becomes schismatic on that path. <coughs> If the path is uh, in schism, its Christians are harder to protect from apostasy, uh, and the local pope won't share his income with you. Economical council, once all paths are filled, 
uh, you have the option to do nothing. Or, if the emperor is Christian, and not heretical, you can try to reconcile a path and schism. You count the number of lands on the path controlled by hostile forces, hostile hordes, tyrants, and Arabs, and pay that amount of money. You roll a die. If you get equal or less than the number of Melkites on green Christian field tiles, free from heresy on that path, you succeed. Uh, flip the path's pope to his hat side. He's back in communion. This will always fail on a one. If the attempt failed, all the Melkites are removed from the path, and the emperor is turned heretical. The council excommunicates him instead. You also lose all those Melkites. Uh, on turn 17, the Byzantine Emperor Justinian revives the Roman Empire. On this turn, all hordes stop at the Roman border. They will not be able to continue further. And place a Roman control marker in Rome. Path A, a horde in Rome retreats. Uh, the ruler there is eliminated. Rome is back in the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. uh, on turn 25... You check the Saxon horde. If the Saxons are Christian, the Holy Roman Empire sets up. But if the Saxons are Aryan, you get the unholy Aryan Empire. <laughs> uh, the HRE is deployed on the land held by the uh, Saxon horde. Uh, then take the Saxon tile, flip it to its Aryan side, and place it one land beyond the HRE in the direction of its homeland. Uh, if the Saxons are Christian in their own homeland, flip the Saxons to their Aryan side and place the HRE in Ireland. <laughs> Beyond. Yeah. Think of the HRE as the Roman control tile on path A. Remove any other such tile. It controls the land that it's in and all other lands on the road to Jerusalem on path A until you hit the Abbasid ruled lands. Any ruler between the HRE and Jerusalem is eliminated. It's absorbed. Uh, lands beyond the HRE are still Saxon controlled and liable to be attacked by rulers. But the HRE is Roman, so rulers cannot be created on the HRE territory. Saxons are beyond Ireland. I thought they were between. Okay. Uh, the HRE is like a Roman control tile. The Roman army may stack with the HRE and help the HRE to invade a territory in either direction. So somehow the Roman army stays well past the fall of Rome, I think. Well, the Byzantines are around. Rome's still there. Um... Unlike a Roman control tile, the HRE can move forward into empty lands. The Unholy Aryan Empire. If the Saxons are still Aryan on turn 25, then Charlemagne is an Aryan. And the Fissiparius, I had to look that up. You can too. Aryans unite to create their own mighty state. Replace the Aryan Saxon horde with the Unholy Aryan Empire uh, tile. The UAE is just a, an ordinary horde, but it's strong. Oh, so you want to convert the Saxons. The Shua Sultanate. On turn 26, the Himyar clans flip over to Muslim Shua, which is intolerant. Doesn't have three dots. And harder to repel. Um, Turkish decision. The Turks begin the game pagan. On turn 26, you roll a die for Turkish conversion. You roll two dice to take the lower roll. On path D, count that many lands from Jerusalem. If the resulting land is Islam ruled, the Turks convert to Islam. If the land is not Islam ruled and is Christian, the Turks convert to Christianity. And if the land is not Islam ruled and not Christian, the Turks become Manichees. Okay. If the Turks go Muslim, the Seljuks enter the land. Uh, the Abbasid tile on path B is replaced with a Seljuk horde. In Jerusalem, if there's no Abbasid tile on path B, the Seljuk army will move on path B on the last two turns of the game. And also if a wafer calls for a Muslim move. The Roman army move. Uh, the player may move the Roman army tile to any Roman-controlled land on the map or to the Papal States. If it's player-controlled, uh, if the army is in the damaged armies box, it goes back to the map. So that is the history phase. Now we go to the secular phase. And like I said, it's, you know, it's a bunch of 
a lot of little steps and it's not really clear you know everything that's going on when when you read through this draw a wafer you draw a random wafer from the wafer cup you put a coin spot up in the active wafer box on the map over here let me get a little cross on there uh the solidari are your wafer chits that's how much money you get in addition you get an additional um money for each path containing both three christian lands and a pope in communion with you they share their money uh, the Solidara, Solidus tile on the bottom of the map keeps track of your monies. It's got a limit. Um, all income in excess of 10 is siphoned off. If the active wafer has a red dot on it, flip the Roman policy tile to Lex Romana, if Rome is pagan, or heretical emperor, if Rome is Christian. Whatever the Roman policy is now, follow it. If it's Pax Romanum, for a dollar you can return any one plain field tile under Roman rule to the field cup and then randomly draw a new one. You're stuck with the new one. Lex Romana. Caesar orders Christians to the lions. You can conduct one free conversion attempt on a plain land adjacent to a Christian land. The Christian land must be under Roman rule. Uh, the other one need not be. <clears throat> Christian emperors, uh, if you have the option of removing a heresy tile in any Roman-controlled lands by increasing Dark Ages by plus one for each heresy tile removed. You lose the game if it goes over seven. It says beware. That's, uh, if it's a heretical emperor, for the rest of the turn, you may only move or use bishops or archbishops who are outside Roman Empire control. If the current wafer has a little crown on it, a powerful ruler may set himself up on the map. Roll two dice to randomly set up that ruler. A new ruler removes any old ruler on his path. If he appears in a land controlled by a horde, he's placed and retreat the horde the next land out. I think back towards the horde. Um, if the attempt succeeds, place the path's king tyrant tile in the selected land, which may be the seat of the ruler. If a ruler lands in a land controlled by Rome, Nubia, Persia, or Arabs, don't place the ruler, reroll the dice, and give them another destination. A ruler appearing in Abbasid territory retreats the Abbasid tile uh, toward Jerusalem, similar to a horde retreat. Uh. Okay, the ruler drives the horde completely back. He doesn't have to land on it. The same with Abbasids. Any ruler that usurps territory from the Abbasids is a tyrant. Don't roll religion. Uh, he could be converted, though, later. If a ruler lands on an uncontrolled papal state's tile, the ruler is a king. Don't roll for him. Uh, a ruler that lands in Thebes or Alexandria when the Bact is there must set up in Ethiopia instead. Now you roll the ruler's religion. Uh, you roll a die using the religious identity of the ruler's seat and the adjacent square land boxes. A land with no field tile is pagan, as is a land with a tan sun field tile. A land with a green Christian field tile is Christian, unless it's heretical. Cons I don't know what it is if it's heretical. Consult the ruler religion table on the counter tray sheet. Mm, it's here. And that'll tell you whether you have a king or a tyrant. Oh, uh, how? Okay, we got all the different types spelled out there. Okay, hopefully that's all the possibilities. Uh, a ruler is eliminated if he's defeated by an army or if another ruler jumps on him. If the active wafer has a heresy symbol, there's an outbreak of heresy which is randomly set up. If a heresy lands on an Arab-controlled land, it's discarded. The caliphate would wipe out heresies. Uh, a land with a heresy tile never counts as Christian for any game purposes, even if it contains a green Christian field tile. And it will force that Christian tile into apostasy at the end of the turn. The Ebionite exception. If a heresy drawn is an Ebionite, it is not randomly placed. It's but on a Jew's field tile on the map. I think you get to pick it. Christian, if possible. And the Ebonites appear there, and they're a normal heresy. Um, they're the only ones in the cup to begin with, so 
they become, you know, they're very common to begin, and if you don't use them up, they'll still be possible to occur. If a heresy tile lands on the Pope, that Pope and all Christians on his path are, her are uh, in a heresy and out of communion with you until the heresy is removed. Now, the Pope's heresy tile doesn't affect whether he's a schismatic. Removing the heresy doesn't cure the schism. Um, the heresy on a Pope does not make the field tile in his land liable, does make it liable to apostasy. Um, again, there's rules we haven't gotten to yet. If you get an EP, then you get an epidemic. You choose to either build a hospital at no cost on a green Christian land that has no infrastructure, or to make a conversion path on any uh, attempt on any path free of charge. Epidemics are good. <laughs> Sudden jihad. When a wafer has a Muslim symbol, all jihad tiles, all Abbasid tiles, and the Seljuks move one space doing combat if needed. Uh, the Abbasid won't go to Thebes if it has a back on it. This only affects paths where there are such tiles to move. Okay, so on the back of... On the back of the wafer, it gives you this information. So the wafer has multiple pieces of information. Pull one and show you. It has a money and it has events and paths. Um, the paths are listed here. A wafer with cryptic alphabetical instructions on it is telling you to move the three horde armies against the civilized world. This one is, not all do. Uh, the instructions are to be read in the same order. Uh, boom, boom, boom. Um, uh, the instruction indicates a path and a number of moves for that horde between one and three. When a horde moves, it moves away from its homeland um, into the next land. If there's no armies, it just takes it. If there are armies there, it fights. If it has more than one move, it keeps going until um, it's used up all its moves. If it's beaten, that's one of its moves, but it can keep coming. We explain all the different hordes, who they are, just historical notes. There's a lot of historical notes. If a horde's colored banner has a plus or a Jewish uh, star, on a cross or a Jewish star, I guess. Uh, then the horde is allied to the player. The player may countermand any wafer's order to an allied horde. That's kind of cool ability. Uh, on four turns, 21, 22, 23, and 24, the Muslim caliphate attacks um, by sending jihad tiles out from Arab-occupied Jerusalem. Each jihad tile has a path letter. During the Muslim jihad steps, you conduct three identical jihad state, um, steps. Uh, you roll two dice. The first die picks the path, while the second die shows how many moves the jihad has. On the first jihad step, you put the dice in the first Arab attack rolls box on the map. On the second jihad step, you put them in the second attack and so on with the third. This tells you which step you're on and how many moves you have left in this step. Each move is identical to the move of a horde, except that the jihad moves away from uh, Jerusalem rather than towards it. It causes combat. Uh, once one jihad step is done, you reroll the dice to pick a new path. It could be the same path. Uh, five lands are marked with these two boxes. Uh, that's a special Muslim conquest roll. Antioch removes the control pa pa uh, path, the Roman control from path C. Path C. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, Alexandria. If this is conquered, path E loses its Roman control. Makes sense. Sufatula. Uh, the Vandals. I'll be switched to Berbers if uh, that's taken. Hmm. We got another one. If the Arab tile conquers uh, Tingitana, the Arabs have not only conquered Morocco but Spain as well. They'll get an occupied Arab occupied Spain tile. Any path a horde in Spain, Milan, or Rome retreats at once to Gaul. A ruler in Spain is eliminated. Any Roman control marker in Spain or beyond retreats to Milan. Um, and at that point, this connection becomes um, 
the shortcut becomes there. Spain gets cut off uh, from gameplay until Spain is reconquered. Thebes. As soon as an Arab conquers Thebes, uh, you can spend from one to five bucks in tribute to try to buy them off, roll a die. If it's equal to or less than the amount spent, the Arabs make peace on the Nile, flip the jihad tile to its Abbasid side, and place the backed tile, which is not a cult of Isis tile, on top of it. The backed can never be attacked or invaded, and can never move for any reason. Seljuks. If Seljuks are in the game, now they attack on path B. Roll a die to determine the number of moves, just like uh, the Muslims. And then the wafer is discarded. Doesn't go back in the cup. Uh, religious phase. Okay, I need to break. So I'm gonna put me some dice there. Okay. Um, the religious phase. This is where the player gets to do things. Uh, he spends money to do as many actions as he can afford and wants. If you don't use your money, you lose it, unless you have monasteries to save it. Uh, each path has a missionary. At the beginning of the game, this is the apostles. It changes to bishops and finally archbishops. Missionaries are sent out to discover, but they can also cons convert what they've discovered. And... They can also be used uh, to end heresies on their path. Apostles begin in Jerusalem. They can move out one land at a time from Jerusalem to the, toward the Horde homeland on the track that they're aligned with. Apostles can only move out. It costs one buck to move them a space. You can move an apostle for free, but this risks them becoming martyred. If you move free of charge, you roll a die in each land the apostle enters after he discovers the land, and the apostle is martyred if he rolls equal to or less than his distance from Jerusalem. Uh, flip a martyred apostle to his relic side, and a bishop shows up on top instead. If an apostle enters the Horde homeland, he's removed from the game, and the path's archbishop is placed in the Horde homeland. Um, this means no relic, Apostles in the game are historical figures. Mark wasn't really... A, a lot of interesting historical uh, factors written into here. I find that really nice, actually. And, um, you know, despite some of the biases in the editorializing, <laughs> um, I find the knowledge that the designer brings to the game very, very uh, extensive. This is not a... Uh, this is something that he studied and, and knows a good deal about, and I find that very appealing. Um, I've learned some things. And of course I do check the things that I learned. Uh, costs a buck to move a bishop one land. Like an apostle, he can only be moved forward. If he enters a horde homeland, he's promoted. He turns to his archbishop. Uh, if he discovers women, there's a problem, though. And when the <laughs> if a bishop discovers a field title with women on it, he gets flustered and retreats. He can pay to re-enter. He only gets flustered by women he didn't expect. In a big city, you get to choose the tile, so you ignore the penalty, even if you choose women, I guess. The archbishop costs a buck, but he can fly to any land on his path and can help with conversion and ending heresy. Of course, you've discovered everything. A square land with no field tile is undiscovered. The moment a missionary enters an undiscovered land, it gets discovered. You draw a random tile and place it. Uh, if you're in a big city, you draw three field tiles and choose one of them to place in the big city. At the end of the day, you want to convert. Okay. Each field tile has a value. The higher the value, the harder to convert, but the more it's worth. To convert a field, you look at its value, pay a dollar, and roll a die. If you roll higher than the field value, the field turns Christian. Uh, if the field is stacked with a pope, an apostle, a bishop, or an archbishop, 
you add one to the die for each such minister in the stack. Okay, so you can convert without someone being there, I guess. But it gives you a bonus. Some conversions can be free. <sighs> Great. <laughs> Um, if a given path has a Bible in its translations box, um, you can flip that Bible to its used side and make one conversion for free on that path. If a discovered field contains a cult of Isis, you can make one free conversion attempt, uh, but that'll discard the Isis cult. The Apostle James can't leave Jerusalem, but James may, free of charge, Make as many conversions and, and heresy rolls as you wish, but only for the Tanjude tiles next to Jerusalem. Keep rolling there as often as you want until he fails one of his die rolls. Once he fails, he's martyred and turns into a relic. Uh, conversion to Christianity is blocked in any, hand, in any land with a heresy tile. All heresy tiles must be eliminated first. Persian Empire tiles modify conversion in their land. The plus one tile adds plus one to conversion roll, while the minus one tile subtracts one. And those are here. It's kind of hard to tell them apart. Oh, probably easier on camera than with my eyes. I found when I looked through the camera lens at my eyes, maybe there's some magnification going on, but whatever. Oh, you can spend money to build infrastructure. Hospitals, monasteries, and universities, each one has two tiles. Only one infrastructure can be on a given path. Hospitals have a military role. Uh, they function as SD units. And we've already discussed them because they can show up for free, remember? Monasteries allow you to put keep dollars between turns. And universities allow you to promote religious freedom and prevent apostasy. It costs six bucks to build an infrastructure. But it's only three if it's built in a location where the, there is local support. Um, and that'll be a U, H, or M on the field tile. And it has to be Christian. Infrastructure still functions under non-Christian rule. The color of the field tile is irrelevant. Uh, hospitals, if retaken by the player, recover their SD use. Universities save local Christians. And you can always use the monastery to save money. Each path has its own language listed next to its faith. Uh, the language can be Latin, Greek, blah, 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 blah. Paths A and F are both Latin. This allows you, uh, translation is an action that allows you to write a new Bible. It costs you six bucks, but every pair of Christian field titles in that language gets you a plus, it gets you a $1 discount. So most of the paths have six tiles, so you can probably get up to three bucks off. But you have to publish your Greek tile first. And you'll have Greek is listed up there under Greek faith. The language. <coughs> and then you'll get the Bible in the brown Bible translations. In the map. Uh, you have to make the Greek one first. Yeah, I think we already said that. Lots of information here. Some of it not, you know, more here, look at this. <laughs> I assume these all say the same thing. I can only even vaguely read the Latin. I tried studying Greek. Uh, Bibles give you a free shot at conversion or a free try at curing heresy. Or you can place a face-up Bible tile on any land of its path and you protect that land from apostasy. You can try to end a heresy in the land. You pay one dollar, roll a die. If you, su you succeed, if you roll higher than the heresy tile. Add one for an apostle, bishop, pope, or archbishop. Uh, add one if the land is under Christian rule. But a roll of one will always fail. You can make this for free by flipping a Bible the right Bible. An ended heresy goes onto the counter tray on its Melkite side. We'll talk about those in a bit. Uh, you can convert dot hordes. Saxon, Bulgar, and Khazar hordes have a dot. 
This reminds you that you can try to convert them to allied. If the Saxon horde is Aryan, or Bulgar or Khazar horde is pagan, you can try to convert it. Uh, you count the number of lands ruled by that horde and pay that much dollar. Then you roll a die. If it's equal to or less than the number of Christian lands controlled by that horde, not counting heresies, the attempt succeeds and the horde turns allied, which can be either Christian or Jewish. Uh, if the current turn has a great theologian, his biography box tells you some interesting facts, but for game purposes, he has two letters. Those are the paths that he can work on. Um, a theologian can only work on one of them. You use the theologian in one of three distinct types of missions. If the Dark Ages is present on the seven box or higher, you can only use them for reconciliation. Okay, evangelism. Pick a path for the theologian. He may then, free of charge, make as many conversions and end heresy rolls as you wish. Keep rolling until you fail. If he fails, um, you put him in the counter tray and you move the Dark Ages tile one space to the right. A revivalist. You can place the theologian on one land on his chosen path. This land is protected for the rest of the turn from any apostasy, no matter what the cause. Reconciliation, you can send a theologian straight back to the counter tray and reduce Dark Ages by one. Persecute. Uh, if you have a Christian rule, you can heal the divisions of the church by sending an army to torture uh, Christians who are unorthodox. The target of the action must be a schism under Christian rule uh, in Roman HRE or Nubian territory and a land a land ruled by a Christian horde or under a Christian king. If the schism tile is in Roman territory, the emperor must be Christian. To persecute the Christians, you spend a dollar, flip the schism tile to its pope side, and then flip the faith tile on its path to the submit side. This will show that the pope on the path is now in communion with you, but not by his choice. The effect of persecution is the Pope's now face up, which means he raises cash, but it's harder to preserve uh, Christian lands on that path from apostasy. Um, now you can launch offensive using the Romans, Nubians, and HRE, and this is using the combat rules. They cannot move forward into empty lands that contain no hostile armies. The HRE and Nubians may, may invade such empty lands. <coughs> Uh, Rome, Nubia, HRE can also do backward attacks towards Jerusalem. Those also cost a dollar. I don't remember if there were free attacks. If a tyrant seat is Christian or is adjacent to any Christian land, you can try to convert the tyrant. You pay three dollars, roll a die on the ruler religion language as if you were creating a new ruler. If you get a king on there, you flip him over to a king. And now he's Christian. If a relics tile is in Jerusalem or in a green Christian land, you control it. You're then allowed to cash it in. Uh, turns 10 through 24 for a buck. Turn 25 or later for two bucks. Um, and then it's just gone. You can move the Roman capital. If the Christian emperor is on the map, you can move the Roman capital to any big city under Roman rule at the time. It costs $1 to move it from a friendly controlled land and $2 from a hostile land. Uh, and now you have an SD unit in that location. There are three knight tiles. On the back, they have a pray for peace icon. These are all V armies. They can never be used in attack, only to defend. Take a knight from the damaged army boxes or from the map. Put a any land under Christian roll. Moving the knight costs a buck. Two bucks if the land goes is in schism. A pray for peace works the same way, but only goes in green Christian lands, not under Christian political rule. It costs a dollar to deploy a peace tile. Okay. <laughs> okay. Spanish Reconquista, on turns 25 through 27, you can attempt the Reconquista of Spain if it's Arab occupied. And the field tile in Spain is Christian without heresy. 
You count the number of Aryan, Abbasid, and Tyrant controlled lands on path A and pay that amount of money. You roll two dice. If your die roll is less than or equal to the number of Christian tiles on path A, you succeed and you flip the Arab occupied tile to its Reconquista. Um, and I think you can do this more than once. Build Melkites. You can spend a buck to place a Melkite on any Christian Greenland on a path whose Pope is in schism. Uh, the Melkites affect the economical councils. Uh, as you beat heresies, they show up. End of turn phase. Hey, we're almost done. If the Dark Ages tile is on seven or more, you lose. <laughs> now, a theologian could have fixed that, but yeah, it's risky. Um, the heartland of the Zoroastrian faith is marked with the flame icons around Persia. Oh. Oops. Um... If all three lands are Abbasid, the Persian Zoroastrian tile is flipped to Muslim, unless you pay $5 to stop it. If it does flip, you lose religious freedom in those lands. Uh, Christian apostasy. Check every green Christian field tile on the map. If it's controlled by a non-Christian horde, controlled by the Abbasids, or controlled by a tyrant, or occupied by a heresy, then it's in danger of apostasy. An endangered field tile must go into apostasy, unless you prevent it. A tile with three purple Byzants grants religious freedom to the lands it's in, no matter who controls it. A horde with Byzants grants religious freedom to all its controlled lands. If the Persians are Zoroastrian, religious freedom applies to all three of the flame lands. Uh, no field tile in such lands is in danger of apostasy unless heresy is there. Heresy will always top religious freedom, and that makes sense. I gotta swap batteries. So, apostasy can be prevented if there's no heresy tile. Um, you have to pay money. Depends on the path the field is on. If it's in communion, it's a buck. Schism, it's two bucks. If it's a submit, this is the worst possible case. It costs three bucks. Uh, if it's not turn 27, you skip this. But if it is, you score the game. Um, let's jump ahead and go back there. Uh, the turn draws to a close. Lex Romana goes back to Pax, or Heretical Emperor goes to Christian. Uh, the Theologian goes back. The Bibles flip back. If you have any unspent money, you lose it, unless you have monasteries, in which case you can save one dollar for each monastery, up to a maximum of two, because there's two. And then you start over again. All right, how do you win? Uh, it's the combined value of Christian lands, but you lose one for every land that doesn't have a field title at all. You never reached it. You get five for each path where all the lands are Christian. You get five if the Reconquista has happened. You get five for each land still under Persian rule. Huh. How do you keep the Persian? Um, three for every non-schismatic pope who is not stacked with a heresy tile. One for each dollar in your treasury. Now, you haven't lost money, so you, you get victory points for each buck you save at the end of the game. Uh, three for each relic on the map and three for each monastery, university, or hospital on the map. Make that a four if it's Christian political role. You lose five for each heresy tile and five for each submit tile. You lose ten if the Roman capital is not Christian. You lose one for each Dark Age level and five for each Bible that has not been translated. And then you try to aim for a hundred points. Uh, 80 to 89 is the average. And that is it. We have some of the designer's life story, which is kind of interesting. He started out uh, as a Mormon, and uh, then I think became Episcopalian eventually. Um, 
So anyway, that is the rules. Uh, I'm looking forward to the stop. I don't generally like solo games, but the topic is intriguing to me, and I'm hoping the story will be good. Uh, again, some of me wanted to play it out so that I could give a more... Uh, a more knowledgeable play, but... I'm feeling a lot more comfortable now explaining the rules with the whole thing set up. When I read the rules, because they're just this, do this and step this, do this and step that, uh, I felt a lot more kind of like, eh, I don't know what I'm going to be doing. Uh, but yeah, so I'll probably start this tomorrow. I think it's too late tonight. So up it goes.